Hola, James. ¿Qué tal? Hi, I'm very well. Lovely to be. Can we just take a minute to have a look at this amazing building? We don't have things like this in London anymore. So it's really nice to be here. You have to take many photos of this place. I've taken space. far too many photos. <laughs> okay. Eh, quería preguntarte para empezar, porque has empezado con este Rachmaninov. De todo tu repertorio, ¿por qué has decidido escoger esta pieza que es tan dramática para dar comienzo a tu, a tu recital, bueno, a esta charla musical? I thought maybe I'd help wake everyone up a little bit. <laughs> um, I love Rachmaninov. I love him so much. I, I have his name tattooed on my arm in Russian. Mm -hmm. Although I don't speak Russian, so it might say Elton John, <laughs> as far as I know. But I think it says Sergei Rachmaninov. And el nombre y el apellido? Yeah, oh. and I love him. So, sorry? Si está el nombre y el yeah, the full name. Uh -huh. Sergei Rachmaninov. I just, I love the piece. And the great thing about that piece, it's a prelude he wrote. It's the first prelude he wrote. He was a teenager mm -hmm. when he composed that. Mm -hmm. And I always think it's important to acknowledge that, because I don't know about here in the Basque country or in Catalonia, but in England, music education is in such crisis mm -hmm. that it would be incredibly rare for a teenage boy to compose a piece like that today. Mm -hmm. tu, tu vinculación con la música clásica, tu descubrimiento también se remonta a una edad muy temprana. Eh, tuviste, bueno, los hechos que todos sabemos, fuiste, fuiste violado repetidamente desde los seis años por tu profesor de, de gimnasia o de boxeo y a los nueve años eh, descubriste una obra de Bach, de Bach Busoni, la, la Chacona, que dices de esta manera tan franca que salvó tu vida. ¿Qué supuso el descubrimiento de, de esa obra para ti a esa edad en concreto y qué hubiese sido de ti si no lo hubieses descubierto? Pues, well, como puedes ver, el libro es una comedia. Um, and I discovered, I was seven actually, not nine, when I discovered it for the first time on a cassette tape, because um, I'm really old, and mm -hmm. I found this little tape lying around, and I, I put it on and listened, and it was the first time in my life that things made sense, and things felt safe, and I was just transported to this whole new world, and I suppose in a way I'm really lucky um, that I found out then at seven, what I wanted to devote my life to. I uh, just, you know, thank God it wasn't a Bible or, or, or finding Jesus or something, because I would have been an even more mixed up kid. But this piece of Bach was mm -hmm. absolutely, it just made me feel safe. Mm -hmm. Por curiosidad, ¿de quién era esa cinta? ¿Dónde estaba? ¿Dónde la encontraste? ¿Cómo apareció? It, it was literally just lying around the house. No, we had Lo lots and lots of cassette tapes and I found this one and put it on and and everything changed mm -hmm. but I think everyone has moments like that in their life where they find a song or a piece of music or a painting or a book when they're young and they never forget it it, 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 it changes things for them mm -hmm. um, ¿Crees que tuvo que ser esa pieza en concreto la chacona de Bach en el arreglo de Busoni no podía haber sido cualquier otra forma de arte la pintura, la escritura o incluso cualquier otra, otra música, una sonata de Beethoven o un periodo de Rachmaninov, ¿crees que tenía que haber sido necesariamente esa pieza la que descubriste y la que te ayudó a seguir adelante? No, I think it, it could have been really any piece of music. Um, I don't think a book or a work of art, I think I was too young for that, but any piece of music by Beethoven or would have done it for me. It just happened to be the Chacon. And, but the reason I know that any, any piece of music would have done the same thing was because the Chacon for me was a springboard. It was like a trampoline. Mm -hmm. And from there I moved on to other composers and other pieces. And every single time I heard one of these one of these new pieces, it had the same effect. And still today that's the amazing thing about music. It's like a drug with no side effects mm -hmm. and it, it always works. Mm -hmm. eh, esa pieza concreto el descubrimiento y de ahí la entrada al mundo de la música clásica es lo que te llevó también a empezar a estudiar piano por tu cuenta, de forma autodidacta. Un trabajo muy, muy, muy ambicioso, ¿no? Es el, el empezar un instrumento como el piano tiene muchísimas trabas a la hora de empezar, cosas que debes saber para poder aprender a hacerlo bien. ¿Cómo fueron tus inicios en el instrumento? Yeah, I started by myself, just playing around. I didn't get my first proper teacher until I was 14. Um, 
there was a teacher who wasn't particularly good, but who showed me the basics when I was younger. And then it was finding a room with a piano at school was just the best thing ever because it provided a safe space mm -hmm. for me to practice and to play. And I, I wasn't very good. I mean, I really wasn't very good. I was a pretty awful pianist as a child, but I had so much enthusiasm that I got better kind of quite quickly. And then when I found my first real teacher when I was 14, I spent four years with him and worked really, really hard. And it was very late. I mean, I wouldn't recommend that normally you start at five or six years five old six. and and your body develops differently and your muscles develop differently and you learn how to play, you know, really secure technically. Mm -hmm. And that took me a lot longer. It's a bit like learning a language. If mm -hmm. you start learning when you're four, you're fluent by six or seven. But if you start at 14 or 20, it, it takes a lot longer. Mm -hmm. Sin embargo, a pesar de, de todas las cosas negativas que había en tu vida y, y de, de, lo, de lo que tenías que afrontar desde una edad tan joven, tuviste muy claro en ese momento y a esa edad tan joven que querías que la música fuese tu futuro o estuviese en tu futuro de alguna manera. Sí, lo hice. Y sabes lo que la verdad es que no conozco a nadie que no haya tenido una vida difícil. No quiero this book to be, in England we have this phrase, misery memoir. It, it's not that at all. I, I haven't met anyone who hasn't gone through some degree of trauma, a, a parent divorcing or um, a, a pet dying or abuse of some kind. And we all do that, we all experience it. And if we're lucky, we manage to find something that helps us along the way that isn't destructive. And for some people that's sport and for some people that's art. And for me it was music. And still to this day, it, it's the one consistent thing that has never let me down. And I don't think that's unique to me by any means. I think we all experience things like that. Mm -hmm. En el libro eh, propones una escucha de una pieza de música acompañando cada uno de los capítulos. Empieza y termina con el área de las variaciones Goldberg. Y luego en cada uno de los capítulos propones eh, la escucha de una pieza y explicas parte del contexto de esa pieza y del compositor. Eh, Hablas de Bach, hablas de lo dura que fue la vida de Bach, que le hacían bullying en el colegio, perdió gran, gran parte de su educación básica por, por el odio que le tenía a su hermano, los problemas, hablas de que Schubert era eh, feo, pobre y, y, y muy infeliz, hablas de los problemas de carácter de Beethoven, de, de los problemas de depresión de Rachmaninov. Eh, ¿En qué manera se reflejan estas cosas? dentro de su música, en qué manera se puede percibir, porque imagino que mucha gente tiende a pensar en la música clásica en términos de melodías, ritmos, eh, pero es difícil introducirse quizá en lo que está detrás, en cómo reflejan las vidas de los autores que las han escrito, cómo puede verse todo este ámbito psicológico que está detrás de las notas. Well, that's a really long question. <laughs> um, or you've really read the book, haven't you? <laughs> Fucking hell. Um, <laughs> oh, God, I shouldn't Perdón. say that in church, should Tentaré I? Ser más, más breve. Um, I don't think... What I don't like is the idea that madness and creativity is linked. Lots of people say, oh, you know, all composers are mad. You have to be tortured to be a genius. And... It's, it's completely untrue, it's completely untrue. These incredible composers, they suffered the same as you and I suffered. They were anxious, at times they were depressed, they suffered grief. Um, I mean, Bach in particular, he was orphaned by the age of 10. Mm -hmm. uh, most of his siblings died, his first wife died. He had 20 children, but 11 of them died as well. So, I mean, the guy knew what suffering was about. Mm -hmm. and. And that's the human condition. Um, they composed despite feeling those things, not because of it. And I think it's a really important concept, this idea that creativity, I think, is a form of mental wellness. It's not a form of mental illness. Um, when it's four o'clock in the morning and you want to throw yourself out the window because you're feeling slightly crazy, they had a manuscript paper and a pencil, or they had a canvas and a, and a paintbrush, or they had um, a computer to write books on. And 
that to me is, is an escape for them. And it's something, like I said, if we're lucky, we manage to find something like that. So of course there's madness in the music. And I don't think classical music is very mellow at all. But what's interesting is how it's a mirror to us, the audience. Because I can play you a piece and there may be 300 people here. And I guarantee that every single one of you will have a different reaction and a different experience when you listen to the same piece. And I'm sure it was the same for the composer as well. Crees que estos compositores, tú has dicho que cuando empezaste a a estudiar el piano, te encerrabas en las clases en tu colegio, encontrabas un espacio sagrado, un espacio de para estar a salvo. Crees que para compositores para como Schubert, por ejemplo, que que compuso tanto en una vida tan corta, la música suponía algo parecido para ellos también, una forma de un espacio sagrado. I think everyone can find a sacred space in all kinds of things. Um, sometimes it's a woman, sometimes it's the wrong woman, <laughs> sometimes it's music and art. And I don't, I don't think Schubert did really find. I mean, you mentioned Schubert. Yeah, I don't think he did find a sacred space. He was permanently unhappy and miserable and had no money and was riddled with syphilis and all his hair fell out and he was five foot tall and he was so ugly, his nickname was Mushroom Face. And I mean, he had the most miserable life ever. And yet, he died age 31, having composed nine symphonies. Beethoven at 31 had only written one. Mm -hmm. And that to me, it's 21 piano sonatas. A thousand songs nearly. I mean, it's, it's insane how prolific he was. And I don't think it's because he felt safe. I think it's because he didn't have a choice. He had to do this. He earned no money. In the last 10 years of his life, Schubert, he earned, on average, about 1,000 euros a year in today's money. So he earned nothing. And I think a lot of people would give up. And you know they would go work in a pub <laughs> or in a bank. And, but he didn't. He had to compose. Um, if you're lucky, it becomes a safe space. But you know, also, with anything like this, it, it can be a safe space one day, and then the next day you hate yourself because you think you're composing awful music, which nobody wants to listen to, and it can change. Um, and so I suppose as I get older, I realize sadly that there's no such thing really as a safe space anymore. I can do what I can to help make things comfortable, but things are very changeable. Llega el momento de que toques la segunda segunda pieza de la noche, ¿qué pieza has escogido y, y cuál es la historia tras esta pieza? Um, it's a piece by the rock group Queen. <laughs> I thought, um, I thought mainly because of the acoustics in here. There's a piece <coughs> written by uh, an Italian composer called Alessandro Marcello uh, for the oboe, mm -hmm. <coughs> and Bach heard it and fell in love with it. And he loved it so much, he transcribed it for the keyboard. Um, and I heard this piece for the first time. I was <laughs> in a locked psychiatric ward, and a friend of mine smuggled in a tiny little iPod Nano, because I wasn't allowed any, any presents or anything like that. And I remember at about 2 o'clock in the morning, hiding under the covers and listening to this piece. And it was Glenn Gould playing it. And I thought I had heard everything that Glenn Gould had ever recorded, and I hadn't. It was the first time I heard it. And it absolutely did more for me in four minutes than nine months of hospitals and a thousand pills had ever done. Um, it just, it made me, it convinced me beyond doubt that if music like this can exist in the world, it can't be a bad place. So this is the Bach Marcello Adagio. Thank you. <laughs> 